Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. This episode of Your Partner in Success Radio with host Denise Griffiths is proudly sponsored by the world-famous author, sales trainer, and speaker, Ben Gay III, and his equally famous sales training series, The Closers. And for special pricing and free shipping on The Closer series, visit stores.ebay.com forward slash Ronzone Books, R-O-N-Z-O-N-E Books. And by the way, I have these books, and I dig into them regularly. In fact, in my opinion, they should be part of every entrepreneurial library. So welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. I'm your host, Denise Griffiths, and this podcast is ranked in the top 2.5% of the most popular podcasts globally, and it's all because of my truly incredible guests. I am honored and blessed to share time with people who are honestly at the top of their game and they are here and absolutely willing to help you get to where you want to be in life and in business. These are not people who hold back. Their goal is to share with you the essence of peak performance. And my guest today, Peggy Lundham, is the owner of Better Working Together, LLC. She has a Master of Science degree in organizational psychology, and she's certified in a number of popular and effective assessments. They're all powerful tools to enable employers and employees alike to create and flourish in a better workplace. And her work is dedicated to the betterment of individuals and organizations by using the latest research <laughs> I can do this research too many S's today in leadership, neuroscience and positive psychology. She's also the author of Navigating Uncertainty and A to Z Guide for Well Being. I have that book on my desk and I was really lucky to get three copies. Her agency sent me a copy. She sent me two, and I've already gifted two of them. I was just so excited to give those books away. So, Peggy, welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. It's good to have you here, and thank you for sending me those books. Oh, hello, Denise. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I was all excited. I got the book, and ooh, yeah, I love this kind of work. And, of course, you know, you were referred to me by our mutual friend, Devin Blaine. And if Devin says, I really would like you to interview this person, that's an instant, you bet. I don't even ask. She, you know, she knows exactly <laughs> what the podcast needs and who, you know, who I need to interview. And, I mean, here we are. So tell me a bit about you before I start rambling and asking you questions. Yeah, so I am a business consultant and executive coach and I love my job. I sort of have the best job in the world because I get to combine two of my great passions and that is science and people. I'm a people person and I'm also really a data nerd. So this has just been kind of a great mix for me Um, and I just love what I do and I just love it when people can flourish in the workplace and in their own lives. Well, and These days, and I hate to keep going back to COVID because I have a very negative perception of how COVID came to be and what it's all about, and we're not going to go down that road, but it changed so many things. People who were, you know, relatively sane or seemed to be, all of a sudden they weren't. I mean, it really was, it was devastating, the personalities to work, to I mean, it was just devastating, and it continues to be so. So we need more people like you saying, hey, it doesn't have to be this bad. It doesn't have to be like this. Basically, and I'm going to put words in your mouth, but pull up your panties and do better. You know, just don't have to wallow in it. Yeah, um, I think what we kind of boil down to is just the fact of agency. Like, what in life do we have control over? Um, Mm -hmm. And it's really, really easy to get caught up in what we don't have control over. You know, we don't have a lot of control over, uh, you know, there's a laundry list. You can fill in the blank. But, you know, the stock market, the political 
aura that we're in right now, the, you know, COVID, whatever. There's a lot we don't have control over, but we have so much we do have control over. And it's important to kind of be able to focus on that. And I think that's kind of the essence of well-being is finding what we can control and then figuring out what is best to move us forward. What can we change? And there's so much that we can do. So there's my book is full. It's got like over a hundred tips and tricks from science of ways to help us move forward out of this being stuck um, feeling. And you're right. People, if, if you talk to people these days, you get, you know, if you haven't seen them in a while, they'll say, you'll say, you know, you'll have a little chit chat. How are you doing? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. And then you dig a little deeper and it's like, um, yeah, you know, it's been a lot. And then I hear that phrase a lot. It's been a lot. Kind of it, it kind of covers everything. And then after that, I get the sentence almost invariably, if you dig deep enough, we are not okay. And that's where I'm like, whoa, we can change that. Well, you know what I have found during all of this, but I think I already knew it, but I had to really work to kind of stay the course is to ask myself questions. Is there anything I can do about this? Is this complete baloney? Well, yes, a lot of it is. Should I be bothered with my time and my energy and my angst to go down a rabbit hole with it? And I've gotten to the point where I'm asking myself, is this real? Is this really real? Is this true? Is this pure baloney? And once I answer those questions to myself, I can move on. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it is just kind of putting up some barriers over what we can't control. Um, and that for me involves something kind of silly. I have a few silly habits. And one of them is I only listen or read the news when I'm standing up because that way I don't get sucked down this rabbit hole. Um, actually a term in neuroscience, they call it a ludic loop where our brains love information and they love echo chambers. So if we get kind of stuck in this um, ludic loop of bad news, it doesn't do us any good at all. So if I read the news or listen to the news standing up, I'm like, you know, I never get too comfortable. So um, about 10 or 15 minutes and uh, that's, that's enough for me to stay informed and move on with my day. Exactly. You know, that reminds me of 9-11. I mean, we all knew where we were, what we were doing on 9-11. And I was actually driving into the next little town to go pay a few bills, and I heard it on the radio and turned myself right back around. And when my now former husband got home that night, I was sitting in the window seat. I had the TV on. Look, I cut cable a long time ago, but at that time I still had cable. I still watched the news. And I was sitting on, I think I was slumped on my window seat with my cat. Just He was hanging onto my chest. He knew I needed comfort. And I'm pretty sure I wiped my eyes on him. He was an 18-pound cat. I'm not sure how he dealt with it, but he seemed to. And the thing is, you know, he he was in the same kind of mindset that I was. But when he came home the second day, and it was a repeat of the day before where I was slumped, I was crying, I was just... I couldn't stand it. And he turned the TV off and he put his hands on his hips and he said, was there anything new there? No. Is there anything that is, you know, information that you didn't already have yesterday? No. You need to stop doing this. And I did. And it was a big lesson for me. Don't keep getting in that loop because it was killing me and the rest of the world. I mean, we were all hysterical. Oh, for sure, for sure. And I think that um, just with the frequency of and the availability of news, there's just, we are an information overload. I read a statistic, like the amount of information that doubles is like every 12 hours now. Um, and in medical science, it used to take like 100 years and then 50 years. And now, Medical science is like doubling at the rate of so like 42 days. So even if it's not bad information, just information in general is just can overwhelm us. So kind of just not getting into that overwhelmed state is important for just, uh, I think, retaining a sort of balance in our lives. And, oh, no and I like yeah. what you said about standing up. What did you call that? 
<laughs> well, that's just a habit. But what we don't want to get trapped in is something called a ludic loop, which is where our brains just keep hunting for more information. They almost get this like mm -hmm. dopamine fix from, you know, information that sort of um, – it keeps our echo chambers alive and circulating. So we just need to be aware of that and uh, not, not fall down that rabbit hole. But a really great question to ask ourselves is um, what restores us? Like we kind of know what depletes us, but what restores us? And I think when we think about well-being, um, I think a bigger question is, is maybe we need a bigger definition of self-care. I think sometimes when we think about self-care, we think of, um, I don't know, a spa day or a day out on the golf course. And it's so much more than that. Like we don't think of self-care as necessarily service, but service is one of those things that has shown us um, that really makes us feel better. So, Developing a really broad definition of self-care is important. And I don't know, Denise, do you have anything that restores you that is a little bit different than just the traditional self-care uh, definition? I, I do it all the time. I've learned that you can't just take an hour at the gym. I can't because I get bored. Uh, I really do. I was like, I don't, nobody talks to me, leave me alone. But I I found that if I was trying to chunk, big chunks of time, 30 minutes here, an hour there, it really doesn't work for me. So what I wound up doing, and I love index cards. Anybody who knows me knows I have this thing with index cards. And I've got them all over the house, and I've got them on bulletin boards. But when I was trying to create some small but consistent healthcare habits or self-care habits, I pasted one on the mirror. It's still there. I've got one up here on my bulletin board. I've got one next to my my television, not my television, but my, my remote because, you know, I have a little dance video that I watched for exercise. And I have, a you know, maybe no more than three things on each index card, and that way they're doable. So I know when I'm in this bathroom or that bathroom or that room or that room, oh, yeah, yeah, go do these. It's going to take five minutes. Five minutes is doable. And at the end of the day, I feel pretty darn good because I got all of my stuff that, you know, in, I didn't take an hour. I didn't have to talk myself into it. I just do it when I see the index cards. It's almost Pavlovian at this point. But it works for me. I love that. I love that you found what works for you. And I think that is sort of the recipe for success because I, when I was writing my book, people were like, you know, most books, you know, have like seven steps or 12 takes or whatever it is. And my book is A to Z. It's like topics and it's all alphabetical order, which is really unique. But I did that just because well-being is so um, personal. Um, what is good for me is going to be very different than, you know, what restores you. And I think what's important is finding out the parts that are most important important and vital to myself and figuring out how to create that well-being in that area. And you've done that beautifully with three by five cards. So kudos to you. Well, thank you. And I had to because I'm one of those people, I will argue with my, my NAF system. She is not the boss of me. So when I'm telling myself, okay, Denise, you need to go spend an hour exercising or on the treadmill or doing, I instantly find a way out of it. My mom told me I should have been an attorney. I can argue both sides of the fence and win. So, And it wasn't working for me. But this works because there's small steps like, oh, yeah, yeah, let me go do that. You know, for instance, just one of them is do squats. I, I'm, I'm a web developer. I'm in a chair a lot. I'm in front of monitors a lot. My hip hurts a lot because I sit wrong and I know this. So in both bathrooms when I'm in there, five to 10 squats. Every time I'm in one of those bathrooms, I'm doing five to 10 squats. Guess what? My hip doesn't hurt as bad and I can bounce out of that chair with no problem. It's just, I, it's Pavlovian. I'm telling you, it is. Like yeah. five squats. I cannot leave this room until I've done those. I love that. And you've actually kind of done a little brain trick of, um, yeah, 
success and you've got a little dopamine hit because you've done something doable and you've accomplished something and you're ready to to take on the next uh, accomplishment. So that's great. And if you keep doing them after a while, they're a habit, and then you can take those cards down because now you're going to do them anyway. And now you're thinking, oh, I feel good. My legs are stronger. Well, look, I've got an apple butt going on. Oh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> when you do this, it really does. But all of a sudden you realize that I'm not even looking at those cards anymore. Now it's a muscle memory. Okay, now I can add new stuff. It's just it's a growth process. It is. And I think all throughout our lives, um, we need to be growing. That's just sort of the ticket to being well and living a really good life is to continue growing. And um, I see people that have stopped growing and it's sad. They just wilt. So that that always looking for the next challenge, the Despite your age, um, it's just it's it's really important. My parents are in their 80s and they are still growing, and I love that about them. I have had some discussions with my dad on a couple of political issues that we do not see eye to eye on. But he's like, uh, you know, I'm I'm willing to take another look at this. Why don't you print off some articles for me, and I'll you know I'll go over it with you. And I thought. You know, for 85, I, I was really proud that he still had a growth mom mindset. And see, I love that because you can't, in these days, it's so easy to be a keyboard warrior and not in a good way and not listen and not ask questions. Listen, a lot, it always surprises me to pe- that people I know on Facebook or LinkedIn, and, you, know, we, you know, we collaborate, we send clients to each other. We are polar opposites when it comes to politics. We get along just fine because we are listening. We're not going to agree probably, but we're going to listen. And I think that's so important. Stop and listen. And then just say, you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but thank you for sharing. Yeah, and I think what you are really modeling in that moment is civility. And our society as a whole, civility has just taken such a hit. Um, you see behavior today that you just never saw 10 years ago. I mean, it's, it's just kind of stunning. Um, being on a plane or wherever you are, it's just, uh, yeah, you just see people acting out in ways. I was at the doctor's office not too long ago, and this older couple were sitting next to me, and they were waiting a little while, and then they weren't doing anything that day. I heard, I heard, you know, I heard this discussion, and then they were. Their doctor was 20 minutes late, and this woman came, got up, went to the front desk, and just let the receptionist have it. And I was just horrified. She looked like this very, you know, put together woman in her 80s, and I was just like, where did that come from? Because it just, it, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. No, by no. by logic, we have lost our manners. There's no no question. Yeah. we're losing our manners. And you're a Southern girl, so you know what manners are. Your mama taught you, right? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and here's the thing about being a Southern girl: we can insult you, and you don't even know it. We're 45 minutes away, and you're saying, "Hey, come back here." <laughs> Did you insult me? And my my observation is, well, if I was too subtle, I can't help you. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, it's it's you know, and living here where I live, I live you know kind of out in the country, and we're just not seeing a lot of what other people are seeing. Thank goodness, and I don't want to see it. I mean, it's just I'll just stay buried here in in Southwest Louisiana. <laughs> And not get caught up in all of that other stuff. But it is, it's ugly. And I catch myself wondering, and maybe you have some tips for this in your book, when people do blow up like that, what happens to their brain? Do they say, oh, I owe somebody an apology? Or do they feel like, well, you know, he was late. Oh, well. I mean, what's going on in our brains right now? Because you talk a lot about brain science, and I think that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah, so our brains have kind of two functions, and one is the sympathetic system, and that's the fight or flight. That's where we're like, we are ready to fight a bear. And then there's the parasympathetic nervous system that's sort of the rest and digest system. Um, And I 
think what's happened is we are so used to being in the fighting the bear stage, we don't realize that it's really not doing us any good and it's really disrespectful and discourteous to society but we're just like constantly on red alert when we don't need to be but you know we got to really take ourselves out of that my book has some tips for getting back into the parasympathetic nervous system state and it just begins with breathing giving yourself just the time to kind of reset with oxygen is just so good for us um, and it's, it's, it just really feeds into that, um, I, I know you've probably heard this, the phrase from Viktor Frankl, but he said, you know, between stimulus and response, there is space. And in that space is our power to choose our response, and in our response lies growth and our freedom. Um, so just taking that breath and, you know, figuring out, am I going to act in a way that I'm going to be proud of in 10 years, um, is really important. Another thing to keep in mind is that negative emotions are contagious, but so are positive ones. And we can certainly start a positive cycle, an upward cycle of positive emotions by just behaving unrelentlessly civil. Um, and it's just a beautiful thing to see when people just uh, start becoming more polite, more kind, and I, sometimes I see this even with uh, teenagers or schools that start some type of a, a new process. And I just love to see that um, kind of that spark of positivity positivity and behavior that can happen because we are very social creatures and we catch emotions from each other. So it's, it's just um, a good thing to keep in mind that what we our, our behavior matters not only to ourselves but to those around us. And, it's, you know, you said something about – you know, will I be proud of this in 10 years? Let's give that five minutes. I mean, do you have, do you owe somebody an apology like right now? It's crazy what people do and say, and they just, uh, apologies, I think, are going to be the wave of the future. <laughs> I'm really sorry I said that or did that. Oh, geez. But you're right. Take a break. Take a breath. Do what I do. Walk out into the, the kitchen Stick your head in the refrigerator and just let your mind go blank. Nobody knows why they opened that refrigerator door, right? So just go stick your head in there and take a break and then go back and go, okay, I don't think that's what I really meant to say. I'm going to, you know, go in a different direction with this. Oh, I love that. I think we should all just get a tattoo that says apologies are going to be the wave of the future. <laughs> I'm seeing it now. I mean, every once in a while, I'll say, oh, Denise, really? And I have to, you know, smack my hand, raise your left hand, smack it with the right. And, but I have learned to slow it down and not knee jerk. I don't always make it, but I do try. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And that, that knee jerk is that sympathetic nervous system that does not most of the time serve as best. Um, because we're not in a life or death fight or flight situation just because somebody posted something super rude on Facebook. Um, I know. So, it's yeah. like, you know, keep on going, block them, go away. What the heck? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, honestly, you hit the nail on the head. Learning to apologize well is a great life skill. And it's so important for relationships. It's kind of the, you know, one of the really sustaining factors in relationships, you know, in the workplace or at home, wherever you are, is just to say, hey, I was wrong. I recognize my actions weren't correct. And I realize the implications of that for you. And I want to do better. So, yes, I think that is definitely going to be the wave of the future to move forward. So, I love I that. I hope so. I hope so. And when you're saying that out loud to somebody else, you're also saying it out loud to yourself. And your mind is listening, right? Absolutely. And I think it's uncomfortable to apologize. Like, I know I don't like it. I, it's just like, it, it's just, it's miserable. I know I have to do it, but it's not pleasant. And so it's kind of also like this little reinforcement, like, whoa, you know, 
I really need to be careful next time I don't just shoot something off that um, is not helpful and actually really harmful. So, yeah, it's, it's a good exercise to do for ourselves. And it comes back to what you were talking about, about growth. We need to have this continual growth mindset um, because that's how we're going to thrive in life and in business. You know, I love what you said about your parents being in their 80s and they're constantly growing, but it took me back to my childhood because I remember my grandparents, my my maternal grandparents are farmers, and they worked literally until the day they died. But I remember my, I think it was my grandfather saying something about a friend of his or somebody in town had retired. You know, he got his gold watch, he got his rocker, and then he died a year later. And that stuck with me because he was bored. He was bored out of his skull. And that seemed for a long time to be, and it may still be, I don't know, but if you, you're retired and you don't have, you know, more goals and hobbies and things that you love to do, grandchildren, I don't know. But if you're just kind of sitting around watching TV, there's not much left for you, is there? No, and I think one thing that we don't think about is that having meaningful work is so important to us as human beings. That doesn't necessarily need to be a nine-to-five paid job. We have to have meaningful work in order to thrive. Um, And that's why it just pains me that there is such a disengagement with um, workers in America right now, and, and actually just globally. There's a huge percentage of workers that are disengaged, and it goes from actively disengaged this year is 16%, and fully engaged is only 34%. So there is like a whole chunk of people that are not doing well at work, and it's costing us financially a huge amount. It's $500 billion a year. Um, in disengagement with employees. So having meaningful work is one of those things that um, I think we don't talk enough about. But what can employers do? I mean, I'm not suggesting that you mollycoddle them and you give them foosball tables. I'm not suggesting that at all. But how do you identify people who are just calling it in, they're bored, they're mad, they're gosh knows what's going on. How do you help? How do, well, number one, how do you identify these people? And then how do you help them? Or sometimes do you just need to cut them loose? Yeah, that is such a great, great question. And I think that is the big question for employers right now is trying to figure out what to do. And if you don't have an engaged workforce, I mean, like right now, they'll just leave. So, and that is a huge cost. Um, the number one thing I keep hearing about is having a psychologically safe work environment. And before, you know, people think that sounds too modely coddly, it, it, it actually means having a team where you feel like you have people that have your back, that you feel like you're being supportive, that your ideas are supportive in the workplace, um, you know, and a bunch of other factors as well. But I think that also can go back to are our managers acting in ways um, that are civil? Are they positive? Are they showing positive leadership? There's so much evidence that shows that positive leaders just have so much better teams and they're so much more productive and so much more, um, is there so many more financial benefits to having positive leadership? And that kind of goes right back down to are these, managers, are they modeling well-being um, for the people that, that work with them? You know, I'm going to go to Top Gun Maverick. I am not a movie person at all. I'm just not. Um, I think the last movie theater I was in was three or four years ago for one of the, I think the first Downton Abbey movie, and before that it was Harry Potter. I don't do movies. There are people in there. They're people I don't go there. <laughs> but but the thing is, I watched it, and what struck me was the teamwork and the passion that every one of them brought, and you know what? The trust. And I think that's where we're, we need to really work. You need to have passion, trust, and a good examples. There's so many things that we can do instead of just sitting in a corner off and say, do what you're told and nobody gets hurt. That doesn't work anymore. 
No, it doesn't. Um, and it used to be that work was pretty much transactional. Like right. your grandfather right. say, you went to work, you did a good job, you got a gold watch, and that was it. You know, um, it was just very transactional type of thing. But now employees want, it's more experiential and they're asking a lot more from the workplace. So, you know, we can argue whether or not that's valid, but it is valid for them and it is valid for our workforce. So we need to find ways to address that. And, um, you know, your grandfather probably didn't worry about being in a psychologically safe environment, right? But yeah. it's important. <laughs> He was more worried about how to get that mule to do what he wanted it to do. I saw him punch a mule one time. I never talked back again. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah, you've got to – work – the whole nature of work has certainly evolved over the last 100 years in such a spectacular fashion. Um, and you need to – kind of keep up with the times and figure out what, what work means for people. It's not, uh, it's not, not mules. <laughs> no. Well, no. I was a small child, and this mule did, did not want to do what he wanted to do. And my grandfather was five foot four if he was an inch. And he just got mad, and he reared up, and he punched. He knocked the mule to its knees. There was a lesson there for me. There really was. Like, do not push so hard that you're going to get punched. How about doing some negotiating instead? <laughs> and I was young enough to, ha- you know, take that to heart. That must have been the beginning of your uh, legal career. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> he never, yeah, I've got one of those monkey brains. I'm thinking 14 different things at one time. Half of it works and some of it's like, Denise, really? What the heck? <laughs> but in your book, you talk about you know, a hundred science-based strategies to overcome uncertainty in life and in business. What are some of your tried and true methods that you work with yourself and with your clients? Well, I keep coming back to, I know it sounds probably like it's been talked about too much, but I don't think it can be talked about too much. And that is the power of gratitude. Um, Neuroscientists tell us that our brains cannot focus on positive and negative information at the same time. So you can try it if you want. It's it's kind of a funny thing to do, but if you stop for a moment and you think about something that is very, very dear to you and you hold space for that and you take a few deep breaths, you just can't help but feel better. It's just the way our bodies work. Um, And I love that gratitude has so many uh, positive effects for us. It can help our hearts. There's done all these studies about our actual heart health. Um, It can lower blood pressure. It keeps us from developing um, all kinds of physical ailments. We feel better. There's lower rates of post-traumatic stress syndrome with people that uh, practice gratitude. We're more resilient. And we have really way, way better relationships in all areas of our life just by practicing gratitude. Um, And that is just so easy to do. There's lots of different strategies, and it doesn't have to be complicated, um, but it can start with just journaling. Neuroscience has shown us that when they've done just a study of a couple months, that being consistent and writing in a journal can actually change the structure of our brains to be able to handle stress better. So how easy is it for to do that? Everybody's got a notebook and a pen. Um, and to actually be able to change the structure of your brain, I think just sounds so powerful, that neuroplasticity that we can tap into. Um, one of my favorite things to do in the morning as far as gratitude is even before I get out of bed, I think, what is something I am truly grateful for that happened in the past? And then what is something I'm truly grateful for that I'm going to do today? And then what is something I'm really grateful for that I'm looking forward to in the future? And just being able to kind of create that awareness, because so often we are just on cruise control, you know, we just are not paying attention to all the benefits, all the good things um, that we have going on in our lives. Our, our brains love to 
to, I think as it keeps us alive, kind of love to focus on negativity. We kind of have a negativity bias. So gratitude breaks that cycle and gets us to a much better physical, emotional, psychological, social space. Um, and it's just by being aware and being grateful. Listen, and you're dead right. You are absolutely 100% right. And I used to be one of those people that would hit the floor running. My eyes open and I hit the floor running and the devil says, oh, crap, she's awake, according to my mother. But I had to teach myself or train myself to stay in bed, not jump out and, and get out and go do whatever I was going to do, but to offer up my gratitude. And you know what I had to teach myself as well? I have a monkey brain. You know, your your brain can go in 14 different things directions all at once. It can be very annoying. So I taught myself to speak it out loud. What am I grateful for? Excessive gratitude. And I say it out loud. I speak it to the universe practically. Then I can get up and get out of bed. I love that. See, you are, you've already got this figured out. That is wonderful. I talk to so many people that don't have a gratitude practice. It doesn't have to be a big deal, but you've already kind of put that into the fabric of your day. So that is, that is lovely. Well, one of my guests a long time ago, and his topic was extreme gratitude. He actually saved his own life by practicing extreme, and he really, you know, punctuated that extreme gratitude. I've never forgotten that. And that's about the time I started saying, okay, well, I need to put that into practice. Then I realized I couldn't just think it because I was also thinking about my Thanksgiving grocery list. So it's like, <laughs> no, nope, that wasn't working. But if, if you... You know, if you stop and think about it, if you're speaking something, you can pretty much only speak one thing at a time. So that works for me. That is lovely. And the other thing to think about kind of when you've been talking about monkey brain is our inner critic. It's that inner voice inside of us that is so powerful. And I don't know, you know, where your monkey brain takes you, but a lot of times, especially in times of uncertainty, our inner critics voice is very loud and very negative. Um, and it's important to recognize that voice, call it out, and go, you know what, that is not correct. Because self-talk is so important. And it doesn't, you know, sometimes we think self-talk and it's all about, you know, patting ourselves on the back and, you know, living in nirvana or something. And that's not it at all. It's listening to that kind of shaming, quiet little voice that can be like, oh, my gosh, Peggy, I cannot believe you lost your keys again. You're so stupid. Um, I and know. <laughs> Honestly, Peggy, if anybody spoke to me in a Walmart parking lot the way I speak to myself, I would need bail money. <laughs> oh, that is so true. Like, would you talk to your friend the way you talk to yourself? No, I wouldn't have any friends left. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely. I, I can be so hard on myself at times. And it's really powerful to stop for a moment and go, you know what? That is not true. I did some things yesterday that I did really well. I figured out how to do this kind of crazy little technology thing on my computer that, you know, is not necessarily my, it's not necessarily easy for me. I called the city and I was able to get something squared away where they had double charged me on my business license. Um, rather than going down the rabbit hole of saying, oh, I hate all this stuff, you know, um, or, I, or I'm not good at it. That's the other thing I love to say. I'm just not good at it. But calling that inner credit out is really important to moving forward. And science has shown us that it's kind of a good thing to give it a name like you know negative call it out negative nancy or whatever it is you, you can give it any name you want inner gremlin is what i call mine um and then you recognize it and say you know that's 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 not true that's not helpful and there are some things i did well so that's one of the tricks and the other trick that they say in neuroscience is to try speaking to yourself in the third person, which sounds kind of crazy, but say, you know what, Peggy, 
worrying about all this stuff you can't control is not helpful. So time to just suck it up, buttercup, and do something productive and positive and move on. Um, so that's another little I trick that I do. I, do. <laughs> I like what you're saying, though, um, about basically you're saying create new neural pathways. Take that negative thought that popped in and say, no, 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 no. We're going to have a chat about this, and you replace it with something positive. There's so much that we tell ourselves that's not true. I know. We, we, yeah, it's so easy, and I don't know why we do it. I think it was probably it was good for us back in the caveman days or something, but it's just not true. Um, so just being able to actually call yourself out and go, hey, is that true, is really a great question to ask ourselves. I think it's, um, I can't remember who it is, um, God, and I can, see her, I can see her face, but she asked the questions, is this true, is this really true? And once you start asking yourself those questions, you're like, well, I'm just a big fat liar. <laughs> That's not true. I mean, none of that was true. Okay, so how, where do you go from there once you've identified that it really just is not true and it's not helpful? What are some steps that you can take, you know, to kind of quickly just move yourself away from that and say, hey, I feel better now? Yeah, I think um, it kind of goes to being kind to yourself. You know, approach your feelings with curiosity and without judgment. So, you know, your feelings are valid. Um, but, hey, if they're not true, you know, why are we feeling this way? You know, did you? you have a conversation that was ambiguous and our brains like to fill in ambiguity and make stuff up. Um, like, yeah, maybe it's one of your, your Southern comments that maybe <laughs> it sounds like that's a, a, a little Southern skill of uh, being so polite. People um, don't realize that maybe it wasn't quite as polite as they expected until they're like 50 miles away and go, Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> But, I've had um, that happen, by the way. Byron Katie, that's who I was thinking of, Byron Katie. Is it true? Is it really true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. You know, and then practicing kindness with others. We are all not at our best at the moment. I don't think humanity anywhere is, like, super flourishing. So um, just practicing kindness with ourselves and then practicing kindness with others, recognizing nobody else is probably, you know, flourishing in a great spot. And when you give that gift of grace, you create this space for something really beautiful in organizations and in the workplace called organizational citizenship behaviors. And that's our behaviors that aren't in our job description, but make the organization a much better place. So that's, you know, kindness, finding commonality and with people with very different views than you have. Um, and that's just a way to kind of get the ball rolling forward from a place that it is now where it might be really stuck. So that's a new one on the organizational citizenship. I like that. Because, I mean, listen, we have to be, I can't be in somebody's office. I don't play well with others. I run with scissors. And if you want coffee, you can get your own damn self. I'm not going to do it. But you, seriously, nobody can afford to have me in their office anyway. I'm unemployable. But the thing is, if you are in an office or you are in some kind of cat, sorry, my cat just stepped on my keyboard. I almost lost you there. Um, he's a problem. We're going to have a chat. So, but, you know, people who are, you know, they're in rooms or they're in organizations with other people, why would they not want to get together? And I don't mean suck up, but why would they not want to make things easier to understand one another and to actually be helpful and to practice, you know, servant leadership? Or do they want and we're just not seeing it yet? Yeah, I think it just takes that tiny bit of extra effort. Um, we get Stuck, especially during times of uncertainty, as being very self-focused. And it's really important that that's not good for us to just stay there, but we need to think about others. It's not only good for them, it's good for us. Um, thinking about others just, um, decreases our own stress and uncertainty. So getting outside of our own little cave and actually practicing kindness 
reaching out and shifting the focus off ourselves is really, really good for our mental and emotional well-being. And it seems kind of counterintuitive because, you know, our anxious brain can be just so busy sort of filling in those case scenarios blanks that it might have, performing acts of service for others, um, practicing kindness, it actually helps us um, in such a better way. In fact, it shows that cultivating, even cultivating an interest in others and building strong social connections give us this like little dopamine rush that's the same as eating a sugary dessert. I am so glad you brought that up because I'm actually on uh, the questions you know, page 67, questions, a case for curiosity. And you've got some brain hacks in there. But the thing is, I mean, and you're saying in your curiosity is vital for thriving. Our brains release dopamine and other feel-good chemicals when we experience novel things with research showing curiosity is associated with higher levels of positive emotions and lower levels of anxiety. I know that to be true. I mean, some of the best conversations I had are on this podcast, they're in my mentorship groups. You know, sometimes, I mean, I will pick up the phone, I'll get what I call a God wink. Because, you know, you, you'll you get this instinct, you'll know, call this person or do this. You know, there's always a sign pointing at something. And when you see that sign pop up enough times, I call that a God wink and you pick, you go, go after it. And I picked up the phone and I called a friend of mine who I had not, I mean, I admire this man tremendously on a personal level on a professional level, and I picked up the phone and called him. We probably hadn't actually spoken in a number of years, but we stay in touch. Listen, we jumped on a Zoom call after that. Three hours, my brain is still sizzling. He literally wrote a new business plan for me just based on a 15-minute conversation I had with him based on that God wink. So, you know, do your best. Ask people for help. Help them. Just be a decent person. Life will get better. I love that because we are wired for social connections. I, you know, you've mentioned that you're more introverted. Um, I'm around introverts a lot, so I totally get it. And you may not need a lot of social connection, but you found that no, we still right. we still need some, right? We do. And, you know, being an introvert means that I just need a lot of quiet time. I've discovered over time that being around people, I'm good for about 59 and three quarter minutes. That's it. I got to go. I'm done. I have to go (laughs) because I have to go recharge. That does not mean I'm shy. And it doesn't mean that, you know, I can't speak. I mean, I'm not even close to shy. In fact, I have no filters. But I do know how I process life best and I created a business that allows me to do that and this podcast is one of the best ways for me to meet people like you and people all over the world and honestly y'all become my mentors after a fashion I mean this has been just one of the smartest things that I ever did for myself was to create this podcast Mm, I love that I love that you've been able to practice curiosity and develop questions and um, continue to learn and grow because that's what you're modeling is what's really important for all of us in developing our own path to well-being is, is creating that space for ourselves to develop. Exactly. And, you know, pe- people will say, oh, you're an introvert. What does that mean? That just means that I need to be alone 98% of the time. <laughs> but I'm a very happy person. <laughs> yeah, And, I, you know, I like people just fine. Five miles away. <laughs> just, yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm not good being physically around people. After a while, I really do have to go. Sure, no. But as you, as the story you were telling with that person that you connected with and you had that three-hour conversation, um, that I bet was felt so powerful when you got off that conversation and you just had such greater insight from that combined synergy. You know, it takes sometimes two brains to 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 create. So I think that's the thing that we need to all kind of tap into is we all might have a different recipe for what that social engagement looks like and what how many friends we need. But we do need people. And um, I think during the last few years, that's something that we really haven't watered and fed 
as well as we could. And that's our relationships because, again, we've been in our cave. So um, and we don't tend to think of friendships as self-care, but they really are. There was a study uh, done by Harvard. And it's a really long-term study. I believe it's 80 years. And they followed these men in the single most important metric to their longevity and their happiness was their amount of close friendships or having close friendships. It didn't have to be a lot, but having some close friends. And I thought, wow, that really speaks to our humanity and our need for, for connection. So, um, yeah, having, having relationships, having friendships, uh, watering and feeding them is, 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 is so good for us. It's such an important part of our self-care. Oh, absolutely. So what are the best ways to leverage physical, emotional, and social connections to increase our well-being? You mentioned friendship. I say pets. You know, I'm a pet owned. Well, I'm owned by pets. I can't lie. Not on the radio. Yeah, there, there's just so many ways that we can. He's looking at me like, uh-oh, you're about to tell an untruth. Um what are some of the best ways that you have found that people can say, you know what, if I just change this one thing or work on this one thing or, you know, maybe have a series of things that I want to work on, but I'll start with this one. What do you tell people? Yeah. So that's not a, a quick conversation to have because everybody is so I, know. I, I like to start with sleep. Sleep is so important, and most people aren't getting enough of, enough sleep, um, especially if they're being anxious. So, you know, figuring out the sleep thing. And then I go down to, you know, what are your core values? And I list in my book some websites where you can take some assessments and find out, you know, what are your core values? Because if you're not in a job that aligns with your core values, you're going to get burned out. Um, so that would be another quick thing that I would go to. And developing some questions to ask yourself, like, are you really living your best life? You know, what could you change? If you were going to fast forward to the end of your life and you were in your rocking chair, what is the story you want to tell your grandkids about how you lived through this time of uncertainty? And what is the story um, that you want to be proud of at the end of your life? And that's in, in chapter why you create your best life and you've got some brain hacks here but honestly and I hate to admit this although I've already done it before on the show I'm not sure what my why is I'm still struggling with that and I don't think that's an easy answer for a lot of people that um, have a really open mind and are curious and are always growing it might be it just might be always Improving, always learning. Um, it could be growing. That could be one of your values. So it's different for. Oh, everyone. I think I love you. You just you just calmed my mind <laughs> because it's always worried me. Why don't I have a solid why? I just don't. I have too many of them. Maybe I don't know. But my attitude is that I'm not going to go until I'm done with everything, and I won't be done with everything until I'm you know hundred or more, and I die in my sleep. While I'm planning world domination, that's the plan. I love that plan and fully support it. (laughs) (laughs) Because, you know, I've actually had people say, well, what is your why? Oh, heck, here we go. I don't know. And people like me don't like to say, I don't know. We get very whiny about it. (laughs) It's like I should know everything. But I really don't know. I don't have any one solid why. And you just told me that that's okay. So, you know, I'm so glad you came on this show. (laughs) You gave me everything I needed to know. Uh, And then, you know, you're creating tattoos that we all need. Like, you know, apology is the next wave of the future. (laughs) You have so much wisdom. It's it's not. It it ought to be. (laughs) I mean, here I, I go on Facebook because I have to have clients. I'm a social media marketing agency, and I'm a web developer. I have to be there. And I'll read some of this stuff, and honest to God, my hairline, my eyebrows hit my hairline. I will never need a face look. I, I face look, I always look like I'm going, what? I look surprised all the time. And then I'm thinking, oh, you're going to have to, not me, you know, whatever I was reading, you're going to owe some 
big apologies when you get home. I'm telling you. <laughs> so it's just, I try to stay away from a lot of that stuff because I get too entertained and worried. I know, I know, but I think you just hit the nail on the head with kind of probably the last thing we'll talk about, and that is laughter. Um, it is so good for us, and it just really this little dopamine hit, this little cocktail. Um, and if you laugh, you just feel better. And developing, you know, learning how to laugh more is such an important part of our day, and it's, it's just so great for us in so many ways. So I love the fact that you can still keep your funny bone intact. Oh, it's intact. I mean, I honestly, I think I'm one of the funniest people I know. I am very entertaining. <laughs> I entertain the heck out of myself, <laughs> which is a good thing since, you know, I don't really like to be around, you know, human beings all that much. But, but you're right. Laughter is so important. And it, I mean, it changes you physically. It, it just does all kinds of great things. And it can just be one good belly laugh and then you're off and running. But you need to be able to find humor, no question. Oh, absolutely. And I think as long as it is, you know, kind, um, nothing's off limits. So I, I, I totally agree with you. And the science backs it up. There's like, you know, neuroscientists that study humor that are just totally on board with this. So, um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a great comedy routine that we're just playing you know, that we can do for our friends or anything. It can just be finding humor in the everyday. And believe me, when you start looking for it, there's a lot to be, to find humor. I was telling my son the other day, I thought, I'm really funny. He goes, Mom, you are funny. You're just not as funny as you think you are. (laughs) (laughs) Now, ask yourself, is that true? Is it really true? (laughs) And then have a chat with him. (laughs) Oh, there's a study, I love it. It shows that nar- having narcissism in teenagers, it's, it's, it really brings you down a peg. If you think you're all that, and having a teenager in the house can really keep you humble. So that's, it's good for us. Being around teenagers is so good. <laughs> oh, I remember when I was a teenager and my siblings were teenagers and we were straight running sociopaths. I'm surprised that any of us survived. <laughs> so, we are not as fragile as we think we are. Our parents don't often try to kill us, even though they probably would be justified sometimes. <laughs> Listen, before I let you go, we've only got a couple of minutes. Give um, Is there any last-minute wisdom you want to share, or you know, what do you want us to know? I just think the last minute with them is just be kind. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and really be intentional about living well. Living well. You mean taking care of your health, laugh your health, laughing, drinking water, sleep, you know, just it's little exactly. mini mini vacations. Just take care of yourself. Is that right? Right. Right. Be kind to others. Find a job that you love to do. Do it with your whole heart. Enjoy your work. Um, find out what that means for you. And um, yeah, we all we all need that. Be good to yourself and be good to others. Well, you can't be good to others until you know how to be good for yourself. Good to yourself. I don't think. Oh, I totally agree with that. It starts with yourself. Yeah. Um, and it, it sh- science shows us that it only takes five weeks of really working on one area of your well-being to find a remarkable difference in your life satisfaction. So increasing your well-being is simple. There's a lot of simple, simple things. That doesn't mean that it's always easy because it takes time and it takes repetition. But if you can get to that five-week mark, of making some change in your life. You're going to be better at the end of five weeks, and we we all can be better at the end of five weeks. So that's just a good goal. Index cards, I'm telling you, they work. Okay, Peggy, where can people find you, and where can they find your book? Yes, so my book is called Navigating Uncertainty, an A to Z Guide for Well-Being, and it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And uh, the website for my book is navigatinguncertaintybook.com. Um, the name of my business is Better Working Together. And my website is betterworkingtogether.org. Oh, thank you, Peggy. It has been wonderful speaking with you. And I, I caught myself laughing a lot. 
I had to mute because I was just chuckling so much. So thank you for being here today, and I thank you for all of the terrific tips and the advice that you shared with our audience. And before we say goodbye, I would like to remind our audience to be sure to look for us on iTunes, Amazon, anywhere else you consume your business podcast, Stitcher, anywhere. Literally, you cannot throw a stick on the Internet without hitting your partner in Success Radio. So look for us, find us, and take us along on your success journey. Peg, again, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was just a pleasure. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab. 